The touch that I liked was that every time she appeared afresh, the furnishings in the studio got a little bit grander, you know. The flowers got larger and the chest of drawers got bigger. We, I loved that. First day I met her, she said... <laughs> she said, I'm a radical feminist lesbian. I thought, what would the Queen Mum do? <laughs> so I just smiled and said, we shall have fog by tea time. <laughs> I said, what is the secret, Patricia? What's it all about? How do you do good work? You know, tell, tell me, tell me a few, give me a tip. She said, I can give you a tip, actually. It's called risk. And if you're prepared to risk everything, then you can do anything. And I've never forgotten that, of course, because if you play safe all the time, if you keep doing what you know is relatively successful, then you'll just keep repeating yourself. Now, that's what Patricia's always been terrified of, and that's why she takes these amazing leaps from one thing to another. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh. She my said, spouse. look, I've always wanted to do something about Hildegard of Bingen, this 12th century nun who founded a religious community, who wrote the most incredible music and suffered or enjoyed these transcendent visions. And it's an extraordinary kind of proto-feminist life. Basically, if you said, I want to do a film on BBC One about a 12th century nun, they'd thought you were bonkers. But if you say, I want to do a film about a 12th century nun with Patricia Routledge, suddenly it becomes all right. She stretches in height from earth to heaven. Her face shines with exceeding brightness and her gaze is fixed on heaven. I think the key to understanding Patricia is her religion. Patricia's Christianity gives her this ability to know that life is both innately transient and ridiculous and deeply tragic and moving. And the secret of comedy, it seems to me, is to be able to encompass both these things. Now, pretension, and particularly social pretension, is at the very heart of comedy. It's at the very heart of English comedy, down the years. Um, and we all know, we can all spot the people with pretensions. They make, they get up my nose, actually. I can't stand that sort of thing. Uh, and so, in a way, I suppose it's my way of getting my own back. <laughs> now, I would like my mail redirected to my sister's luxury holiday cottage, complete with patio and built-in barbecue. <laughs> Yes, she likes us to have the run of the place, which is double glazed with a fully fireproof thatched roof. The bit in um, uh, keeping up appearances I always like is when she fall when the dog frightens and she falls into the hedge, uh, which is pure um, farce. It's exactly like uh, when she comes up all with a all awry, and it's exactly the same. Arthur Lowe does the same thing in Dad's Army, and it's an old farce trick, and I always like that the best. I can't think of another actress immediately who could have brought the physical clowning to the part, which, which isn't there particularly in the script. If the assembled company would uh, please excuse me. <laughs> Something's just come up. <laughs> She's quite naughty, you know, she does very naughty things as an actress. She's, uh, um, she does sort of funny walks and um, double takes and things, um, which some people might frown on and say, oh, um, yeah, mm, you know, maybe you should do it a different way. But that's her trademark. Remember specifically, there's uh, there's a long episode, a long episode we do on board the QE2, which is very popular. And at the end, Hyacinth has to come down from her high horse and dance with Onslow. And Patricia, I think, rehearsed a tremendous amount 
in order to dance in the way she thought Hyacinth would dance. She, she had to find a way of doing a, a jive or whatever it was she was doing in character so that it comes out wonderfully kind of uh, repressed, really. Wonderfully repressed. Abandoned, but repressed. <laughs> She's now become an international success. And when I was over in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago, uh, there she was in my hotel room in, uh, in um, keeping up appearances with Hyacinth Bouquet. So she's all around the world now. Well, I think that if she had gone on as Hyacinth, I think people would think of her only uh, for that, really. It's much, much better to hear people say, oh, aren't you going to do any more of those, than to hear people say, oh, is that still on? I think the way that Patricia has avoided typecasting is to select the parts that she's going to play incredibly carefully. In terms of moving from Hyacinth to Hattie, I think she was um, very conscious of the fact that Hyacinth would have a lasting effect on the public, and still does, and that if she was going to move away from a character that she did enjoy playing very much and did like, um, that she would have to change practically everything and show the public that... Um, this was just a character that she was playing, and it wasn't necessarily her. If you look at the Hyacinth eyebrows, they're not 360 degrees, but they're certainly 180. The eyebrows go all over the place. And if you look at Hetty, the eyebrows are much more straight. They don't, they don't, there's a sort of gaze, there's a stare, there's a seriousness. Welcome to the club. Violets and a poodle. What am I meant to be joining? Crufts. From one seasoned senior citizen to a new arrival, Esther Chadwick. How killer. I put together a lot of northern women that I knew, and out of it came this sort of quite bossy, very energetic uh, lady. The important thing for me was it was somebody who'd reached a certain age and was looking around and realised they hadn't done enough in their life, and they wanted to do something. They wanted to make their mark somehow. And I think that's what attracted Pat to it. Well, let me tell you, Robert. From this day forth, it is going to count. I, Hetty Wainthrop, am going to count. Patricia um, is aware that it's, it's quite a funny thing to see someone of her age being put in these situations where she does have to run herself around a lot. Follow that cab! Oh. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It gets the feet, this job. Scooter's murder on my thighs. We should have a car. It'd pay for itself. I'm thinking of buying a pair of Doc Martins. Another thing that attracted me was that as she becomes more skilled in her detective uh, achievement and experience, um, she does take on a certain amount of disguise in order to infiltrate a situation or a place and I love all that. She, she said to me that she would have made a damn fine headmistress of a girl's school um, if she hadn't been an actress. And I think that's true, that there is that side of her that is not going to be bullied by anybody. But especially now with her experience and her ability, she's, um, she can tell other people what to do just as well as they can tell her what to do, really. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I would say that she's got an enormous talent, a very, very rich talent, that she could go anywhere, do anything. I'm not saying that she could be a, in a roller disco thriller in a shootout with a lot of skinheads, but, well, maybe she could. <laughs> I want to do good work. Uh, 
in good places with good people. That's all. Maybe I will lie down sometime soon. I don't know. But as long as there are exciting uh, invitations, um, and as long as I feel I can respond to them uh, properly, on we go. <laughs> Sing, oh. 